So let's pray and we'll, uh, it's uh, Puritans and Science. So. And then, God willing, next hour we'll do Milton. Uh, so let's pray. Uh, Father, we uh, thank you for a good night's sleep. Uh, we pray that we'd be refreshed uh, in body and soul and uh, that you'd equip us now to, to think clearly, to think accurately, uh, think faithfully and to know that Christ is the Lord of every area of life. Uh, including science, as we're looking at now, uh, help us to think rightly about these things. Uh, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, I haven't sent my notes to Tom, but I should do that for, for yesterday. Uh, but yeah, send around. But here's a quote to begin with Irenaeus of Leon God formed all things in the world by means of the Word and the Holy Spirit. His works do declare him, and his word has shown that in many modes he may be seen and known. Uh, it's only saying what the Bible say, that through the creation we should know there's a creator. Yeah, Romans 1.20, uh, Psalm 19, verse, verse 1, uh, heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, Psalm 104, which is a celebration of the creation, uh, looking to the creator. And, and that opens up science. Now, uh, my father was a lecturer in science, uh, but I think the gene skipped me, uh, and uh, uh, I'll do what I can. Uh, medieval Europe. We work with this two books idea, so let's, let's head towards that, Francis Bacon. Medieval, I'll start with medieval Europe. Firstly, it was, it was not a society that dwelt in unscientific darkness. Uh, medieval Europe knew a fair bit about science and was learning more. The scientific method, so-called, was not invented with Darwin. I think Darwin destroyed it. Uh, the, the idea of Darwin, Darwinism is a philosophy. Uh, the, the facts are actually against it. Missing links, they're missing. That's, that's the science. Uh, how you extrapolate a theory with the missing link still missing, that's a philosophy. Uh, uh, so, medieval Europe knew the difference. Um, so that's the first myth to be dispelled. Apart from any other factor, uh, Aristotle was rediscovered in the medieval period, uh, mainly coming from the, the East, from the Arabs, and uh, being then translated into Latin. But Aristotle was very much focused on the natural world and wrote on it, um, somewhat fairly accurate, <laughs> and... and that was a stimulus to science. But let me quote what you would have heard anyway. A lot of modern unbelievers have a distorted view of reality. So <coughs> I remember we had a, a fellow turned up to a Bible study once when I was at Nambucca and he, he was a science teacher of, of sorts. And um, he asked us about evolution. I said, oh, no, I think, it's, uh, yeah, I think the facts are against it. And he kept saying... I really admire the way you hold to your belief even though all the facts are against it. And I said, no, that's not what I said. I said it's bad theology, it's also bad science, you know, missing links. He said, yeah, but I really admire the way you hold fast. He just wasn't hearing because he was so ingrained with this view that science and faith just don't go together. Um, Bertrand Russell, he says, atheism was the drive behind the development of science. So whatever you do at the end of this, no, <laughs> you forget that. George Bernard Shaw, he, he too wrote that Galileo was a martyr. We'll have a look at Galileo. He was a martyr and his persecutors, incorrigible ignoramuses. Again, that's the myth people like you to believe. Here's um, Francis Bacon, because he's often quoted the, you know, the two books. God has given us two books. There's a book written, you know, word written, and you know, nature, creation, what you see all around us. Uh, and... Uh, he wrote The Advancement of Learning in 1605. He presented it to King James I. And this is what he wrote. For our Saviour said, I'll, I'll, I'll chop out the cess and all that. You err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, laying before us two books or volumes to study. If we will be secured from error, first the scriptures revealing the will of God, and then the creatures expressing his power. Like, so creation won't tell you how to be saved. Yeah, our sins are forgiven. But the creation will show you the power of the Godhead. Uh, yeah, Romans one twenty. 
expressing his power, whereof the latter is a key unto the former, not only opening our understanding to conceive the true sense of the scriptures by the general notions of reason and rules of speech, but chiefly opening our belief in drawing us into a due meditation of the omnipotency of God, which is chiefly signed and engraven upon his works. So we've learned something of the power of God. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, Robert Blair, uh, he, he converted through a cow. He, he, he's just, he's just, it's not an actual conversion, but it's a, an awakening. He's an atheist, uh, he, he's looking out uh, through his window, it's uh, church is on and he's not there, uh, and he sees a cow, and then he says, I don't understand cows, uh, who does? Uh, and, and he says, well, there's got to be a cow maker. <laughs> there's a cow's kind of an intricate animal, and the only explanation I have for a cow is, a, a creator behind the cow and all, you know, the cow is the grass and the, you know, photosynthesis and all this, yeah, I don't know if you knew that term, but, you know, the way it all works together, intelligent designers, well, there's, there's got to be a designer, there's got to be a creator behind all this. So, now, as it stands, what Bacon said is true enough. He has two books. Uh, the, the, you know, a distinction in the realms should not be seen as a contradiction because that's what people do now. They, they turn these two books into two contrary books. Now, I'll, because this is on the Puritans and science, let me, let me talk about the briefly the Royal Society because this is where, if you're a Puritan, often head towards uh, and say this is the, the stimulus to science. The Royal Society was set up in 1660. It was not set up as a, a Puritan organisation at all. It was meant to study all things, including science. And Charles II had given it the right to publish scientific papers without censorship. So you didn't have to go through the royal censorship. Its motto was nullius in verba, take no man's word for it. And of course, that sounds like this. it's all science. The tone was strongly religious. Amongst its founders, there were 10 founders, but amongst its founders is Christopher Wren, you know, the architect, uh, uh, Robert Hooke and Robert Boyle. And here's a quote from Robert Boyle. He's a chemist. Uh, he's Anglican, actually, but he'd been in Geneva in 1641 when uh, Luther Lyke, uh, he was terrified by a powerful storm. And he thought that would be the end of him. So he vowed not to waste his life. Was it Luther, 1505, said, I'll become a monk. <laughs> <clears throat> That's how he edited the Augustinian monastery. Boyle didn't do that, uh, but he worked hard. But he worked hard at chemistry because that was his area, and his scientific pursuits were were part of his religious duty. That's all I'm saying. That's how he saw it. God, I will not waste my life. So he goes into science. He's a devout Anglican. He did write a lot on theological and devotional subjects too. Uh, of the ten founders of the Royal Society, uh, seven are usually said to be Puritans or Puritan-leaning. Uh, by 1663, which is only three years later, 62% uh, of the scientists were viewed as Puritans. So that's the sort of level. It was, so in other words, it was maintained, roughly that, that, that percentage of uh, Puritans amongst the scientists. Now, some of those statistics have been called into question, but the, the link might not be so strongly Puritanism and science, it might be more general Protestantism and science. But having said that, remember there's a lot of Catholic scientists, Blaise Pascal, a great uh, Pascal, um, whom if you, uh, Audrey and Maeve will tell you uh, every second week, I tell you, go and buy Pascal's Ponce's, borrow it, steal it, whatever, read it. Um, one of the great works of the 17th century. Uh, French Catholic Augustinian, and Jansenist, but a scientist, uh, Descartes, uh, Jemima sees more in him than I do, but anyway, <laughs> uh, she was doing a doctorate on him, and, uh, but he was a uh, Catholic background, and Galileo too, Catholic background. But it was believed with good reason, and it's quite biblical, that the study of science implies an ordered universe. I, I quoted some of the passages before, but Genesis 8.22, you know, there's 
summer and winter and why is that? You know, why are our days 24 hours and why can we rely on this rough pattern of, you know, it's cold in winter and, and it warms up and so on. Uh, if it warms up too quickly, people comment about it. If the cold is too cold, it's the coldest winter we've ever been through. Uh, well, Genesis 8 verse 22 says it's that rough order. But why is tomorrow, you know, not three hours instead of 24? You know, how, how can we rely on it? It's tough enough being a farmer anyway. Um, but if you couldn't rely on that, that, that rough sort of water, you couldn't do anything. So moral law requires a lawgiver, and the argument here is that uh, natural law uh, does the same. So it's not only in the realm of morals, but the realm of science. The universe cannot run on a combination of time and chance. If it's all just time and chance, uh, you, you can't have morals, and you can't have science. Uh, so lest we fall into the fallacy, uh, Charles Darwin invented science, Peter Harrison, uh, who is not quite coming from where I'm coming, but, but he knows more about it than I do, uh, he looks back to Egypt and North Africa in the Protestant period to, to Augustine. Uh, he looks to France in the 12th century, Renaissance uh, in the medieval period. Uh, Europe generally into the 16th century and then England in the 17th. We're, we're looking at England mainly in the 17th century. But the, <coughs> the argument's not accepted by all, but I think it's a fairly clear one. And Harrison by and large follows it, that the Protestant emphasis on a literal historical approach to the Bible encouraged the development of science. It did not invent science. It did not invent the scientific method, but it it gave it some impetus. Um, the view today, in, amongst a lot of scientists, is that uh, belief in biblical inerrancy shackled science or hindered it because people um, felt they couldn't step outside of the, the parameters that had been given. But I'm sorry, there's a, if there's an order to the universe, where does it come from? Now, there's an ambiguity to all advances. Oh, this is more philosophy than science, but uh, uh, Hoykas, uh, Roger Hoykas is Dutch. He said, The biblical conception of nature liberated man from the naturalistic bonds of Greek religiosity and philosophy and gave a religious sanction to the development of technology, that is, to the dominion of nature by human art. Now, all you're saying is that a religious view actually promotes uh, investigation of the universe because it's God's universe. So the problem that we've... Because you know uh, where I'm heading with C.S. Lewis. Uh, the quote is quoted again and again. Technology without a Christian basis is a menace. That's, but Lewis is writing in the 20th century, different time period. Uh, so... so if, in his letters in 1945, he was writing that the horror world of the, the National Institute of Coordinated Experiments, you know, NICE, um, was not quite the fantastic absurdity that some people imagined. You know, he's, he's uh, three volume uh, science fiction work. And he, this, this is what uh, Lewis said The trouble about writing satire is that the real world always anticipates you. And what was meant for exaggerations turned out to be nothing of the sort, uh, which is this, the two writers of uh, Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister said exactly the same thing. Uh, and if you've seen any of the Utopia uh, series. Uh, anyway, the, because the world is not divine, scientific experimentation is possible. So uh, I quoted Francis Bacon earlier. This is Roger Bacon. Science needs to be tested via experiments before it's accepted. So, uh, uh, heading is a Franciscan, it's a Catholic. Uh, Robert Hooke, science has to begin with the hands and eyes, in capitals, uh, uh, to be continued by the reason and to come back to the hands and eyes again. Now, it, it, I'm not arguing that this is an unambiguous force for good, and this is what 
some of you would have studied the abolition of man with C.S. Lewis. Man's conquest of nature, he says, if the dreams of some scientific planners are realised, means the rule of a few hundreds of men over billions upon billions of men. There neither is nor can be any simple increase of power on man's side. Each new power won by man is a power over man as well. Each advance leaves him weaker as well as stronger. It's double-sided. Uh, in every victory, besides being the general who triumphs, he's also uh, the prisoner who follows the triumphal uh, car. So it goes both ways. That's, that's what he's arguing. Uh, and, and I think quite compellingly so. That's what, you know, we advances in science and uh, yeah, we can also blow the whole world up, uh, which we can never do with you know, bows and arrows. Now, a quick look at the new astronomy because this will fit. Uh, Gal this is the centre of Galileo. And I'll look at the Catholics and the Protestants here. Uh, the new astronomy is, I'll call it Copernican as opposed to Ptolemaic. Uh, Copernican view, of course, is what we're used to. The, the Earth revolves around the Sun. Uh, the Ptolemaic is it's the other way around. The Sun goes around the Earth. Uh, Milton was interested in this, and we're going to look at Milton next hour. Milton actually, when he was on the continent, he went to Florence, he went out of his way to, to go to Florence, 1638, to meet with Galileo. So there's the, the great poet going to meet with the, the scientist, the astronomer. Galileo at this stage was almost certainly blind. He went blind in the last years of his life, as did Milton, the last 20 years or so of his life, he was blind. Uh, but he wasn't blind here. Uh, so he actually saw Galileo. Uh, he writes about it. He detested the Roman Inquisition uh, uh, because it had bullied uh, Galileo. And in uh, Paradise Lost, he, here's a quote. It's Raphael's reply to Adam. To ask or search, I blame thee not. For heaven is as the book of God before thee set, wherein to read his wondrous works and learn his seasons, hours or days or months or years. This to attain whether heaven move or earth imports not. So Milton said, it doesn't really matter. Uh, he, like spiritually, it doesn't matter who gets it right and who gets it wrong. Uh, so he sees it largely irrelevant, although he, he, he ends out think the, the Copernican view is right. If thou reckon right, the rest from man or angel, the great architect, uh, did wisely to conceal, but not divulge his secrets to be scanned by them, who ought rather admire. Better to admire it than to analyse it and get it right, yeah. So the heavens declare the glory of God. That's Romans, uh, that's Psalm 19, verse 1. Anybody can do that. Just go out and look at the stars. Uh, but not everybody can understand astronomy. Yeah, it's, it's Pluto, a real planet or not, you know, Left those arguments. Uh, they, so, but to admire it is more important because you're admiring the one who made it. Le the creation leads you to the creator. Or if they list to try conjecture, but, but his, he, his fabric of the heavens, hath left to their disputes, perhaps to move his laughter at their quaint opinions wide. So he said, uh, yeah, mock it a bit. <laughs> uh, but you'd go to see Galileo. Having said that, he was more interested in how the Roman Inquisition was treating Galileo than Galileo's theories as such. He, he, he didn't see the Galileo as the enemy, he didn't see him as a friend. He, he, it's just saying probably Milton's not all that interested in the science, but he's not hostile to it. Uh, let's have a look at it. Robert White, uh, who uh, was at Sydney Uni, and I was there, although I never met him, uh, he, he's, a, he's translated a lot of Calvin's works. from. He was a French lecturer. Uh, so he's translated Calvin's sermons from French, the original French into English and the banner of reproduced them, so it was good. Uh, Robert White, he said, The 16th century, which saw the emergence of a new theology and new piety, new church structures, saw also the beginnings of a new astronomy which appeared to revolutionise the medieval world picture. Uh, Copernicus. Copernicus lives a century before. 1473 to 1543, 
uh, so he lives, he's Polish, and he lives through uh, the early period of the Reformation, so he's not the 17th century, you know, he's, he's well and truly dead by then. His great work appeared just before his death, and the churches, well, they didn't have to respond to it, I don't suppose, but um, that, that, they did and they didn't. Um, a lot of it's mythology, but let's have a look at the Catholics first. Uh, <coughs> Copernicus is about 150 years before, or 100 years before Galileo. Copernicus was, the, the Catholic Church just never paid much attention to him, Sorry, as, as such. They didn't see him as a threat. He was actually uh, in orders. He, he, uh, we're not sure whether he's a priest or a monk or a canon somewhere, but he, he did hold some sort of Catholic orders. Uh, and he spent his time studying all sorts of things, but um, if he was a priest, he could have celebrated Mass too. Not, not 100% sure whether he was a priest. He was once summoned by Leo X. Now, Leo X was the fellow who was the Pope when Luther put up the, the 95 Theses. Uh, but Leo X wanted to help with corrections to the calendar, so he calls on Copernicus. The Cardinal of Capua and the Bishop of Colm actually helped Copernicus in the printing of his books, so it doesn't look like he's in any trouble. Uh, in the 15th century, a Cardinal and a Papal Legate, Nicholas of Cusa, had portrayed the Earth as a moving star, to, and that evoked no reaction at all from his church. So, so the Catholics are quite, well, mild here, they haven't done anything. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to, the Catholics at this stage don't seem to have seen Copernicanism as a threat. And so, really, they just left Copernicus to do what he did. Some people then point out things like they burnt Giordano Bruno at the stake in 1600 and he was a scientist. Uh, I don't know that really reflects a, a change in the Catholic Church's view of the new astronomy. Bruno, Bruno had dabbled in astronomy. He, he promulgated the, the, the view of you know, plura, you know, what we call multiverse now, uh, which until a few years ago I thought meant a long poem. <laughs> uh, but the idea that there's a multitude of universes out there and plurality of worlds with um, possibility of life on other planets. We're not central. You know, Psalm 8, what is man that you're mindful of him? Well, why should he be? There's a million other creatures out there somewhere, some planet, that, that, that sort of approach. That, so I think it was his heresy that uh, caused him, <laughs> you know, excusing anything, but it caused him trouble with the Catholic Church. Uh, he, he rejected, Bruno rejected Prayer is useless, and he uh, didn't believe in any miracles. So, yeah, the, the fact that he was part-time astronomer, and that wasn't his major interest, really is, is not part of the issue, I don't think, because it doesn't fit in with the way the Catholics treated Copernicus. Now, the Protestant Reformation led to the Counter-Reformation, of course, and the Counter-Reformation did lead to some reformation in the... Catholic Church, but also led to a certain hardening of the arteries. Uh, and there, there was, it, it coincided with a strengthening of the evidence for Copernican uh, or Pythagoras type ideas. Um, and the Catholic Church became harsher in its response because it had been threatened by the Protestant Reformation and, and then well, there was more. In short, Galileo could not prove that the Earth revolved around the Sun. The science was not at the stage where it could prove it. He thought the evidence was growing for it. And the only reasonable scientific explanation then, response of a scientist, would be to say, this is looking more likely, but to reject it you still had a fair bit of reason to, not, perhaps not to reject it, to be cautious about it. Um, 
But anyway, here's Galileo. Uh, visit, he visited Rome in 1611, and, and he was fine. He didn't have any trouble there. Uh, he was praised. Uh, the church authorities gave him honours. Even the Pope received him. And Galileo actually said this, everyone is showing me wonderful kindnesses, kindness, especially the Jesuit fathers. Uh, the Inquisition in 1616 was relatively moderate. It, it declared that the sun was not immovable uh, and that to believe otherwise was heretical. It, it also condemned the concept that the earth moved on its axis around the sun. It, it rejected it. This is a 1616 Roman ex Inquisition. And Copernicus works. Now, remember Copernicus, I'll, I'll call him a Catholic canon. I think it's more like he was a canon than he was a, anything else. Uh, it was associated with the cathedral. He, uh, his works were put on the, what they call it, the index, the index of prohibited books. You weren't allowed to read them if you're a Catholic. Uh, and that's 70 years after his death. So it didn't affect Copernicus much. Uh, the judge was Cardinal Bellamine, and and he was not he was not all that keen on this. He was more favourable towards Copernicus, and no action was taken against Galileo. But there's a bit of threat there. You, know, you want to run with this? Uh, Bellamine tried to induce him to see his errors and to give up the theory of Copernicus, but the, the that put the Catholic Church on a collision course with Copernicanism. It, having declared against it, it then took, at this stage, no action against its greatest living exponent, this Galileo. Now, Galileo's personality comes into this, and, and this has been discovered in more recent times, I mean, like 50 years or so. Actually, look at the man himself. He was a belligerent sort of, belligerent sort of character. He, just, he liked to fight. Uh, it didn't at all, they didn't mind one at all, and um, I, I think you you could say he was a bit belligerent here. You could, you could, have, but that's probably true of everybody in the 16th century. You could have framed this phrase this a bit differently, you know. Thomas More was, you know, Tyndale, he, you know, they call each other everything. Uh, Luther in full cry could be, yeah, you know, he got all these zoological terms of abuse that he. <laughs> Uh, hurl around and, and um, so it's not unusual uh, anyway uh, Galileo cited Cardinal Baronius to the effect that the intention of the Holy Ghost is to teach us how one goes to heaven not how heaven goes now that's, that's unarguably true but it's open to many uh, interpretations or connotations that's the, that's, it's like the two books of Francis Bacon yes but there's possibilities of doing a lot with this that um, are bad news. When it's taken to extremes, which is not the way Baronius meant, I mean, you, you get views that became quite common in the 19th century that the Bible is true spiritually, but not necessarily scientifically or historically. So there could be all sorts of errors there, but it's true spiritually. And that's German idealism. That's, li that's liberal German theology. So... Uh, you know, things like honesty, that's, that's, that's an ideal, yeah, that's, it's designed to change our character. But of course the gospel rests on history. Christ died, well that's history. If it didn't happen, the Muslims don't believe it happened. Uh, if it didn't happen, if the penalty for sin is not paid for, the gospel falls a bit. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, that's history. If that's not true, all the ideals won't mean anything, yeah. So German liberal theology, which is based on German idealism, uh, was, was disastrous, but it, it was not just German ideal. You know, it got in, uh, exported to other <laughs> places, including Australia, and the early, I'll call them liberal evangelicals, a lot of them trotted out that view. You know, we got it right on the spiritual life, and this is the spiritual life. You, you just make Pharisee, Pharisees really <laughs> with that sort of view you're not making Christians you're making people who believe certain things and this is how they're saved and they do certain things and you've got the eye a very common view oh, he's not a Christian but he's, but he's honest and 
Now, sometimes that's got meaning. I'm not saying it's got no meaning. But that became a... You didn't have to be a Christian. You didn't have to believe in Christ and crucified and risen. You just had to be a pleasant sort of character. Uh, maintain these good ideals. A good citizen. And that was enough. So it depends what you did with it. Now, there was a, a section of the Catholic Church that was baying for Galileo's blood. And uh, this Jesuit father, uh, Melchior Inc- uh, he went. He, he said the arguments against the immortality of the soul, the existence of God and the incarnation should be tolerated sooner than, in, than an argument that the earth moves. <laughs> that's a bit extreme. <laughs> uh, uh, that's what you say when you're cranky. Um, by and large, that diatribe was, was discarded, was just disregarded might be better. Uh, and there were a number of Catholics who saw Copernicanism and the Scriptures as not inherently contradicting. There's not many passages that you'd use against it. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 5 says, The sun rises and the sun sets. That makes it sound like, you know, the sun goes around the earth. But we use that language now. You know, listen to your news, and the weather report, the sun rises, the sun sets. And for anybody to say, well, it's not actually the sun rising, the sun setting, it's the, it's the earth rotating around the sun, and, and give a long-winded explanation, and that misses the point. You're only talking about it as it appears to you, uh, and that's the Bible's language. So, yeah, if I say it's, it is not the same thing, but if I say it's raining cats and dogs, I, I, that's, that's a colloquial expression. <laughs> but if I say it, the sun rises and the sun sets, that's not quite a colloquial expression. But it's it's not meant to be a scientific treatise, it's, um, and, and the fact that yeah, four hundred years after Galileo, we still speak like that is indicative. So, all right, here's uh, uh, so a number of Catholic universities banned the teaching of uh, the new astronomy. Uh, so the Catholics are hardening. Uh, and Johannes Kepler is sometimes trotted out. He, he's very hard to pin down, Kepler. He's a Protestant and he's an astronomer. He called himself the Luther of astrology. He, astrology then meant astronomy. So don't, he wasn't in the, you know, reading his tea leaves or anything. Uh, stars or whatever. Uh, but the Catholic Church gave him a bit of a hard time at times. But that's because he was a Protestant, not because he was an astronomer. Uh, and so he was expelled from southeast Austria, 1598, as a Protestant. Uh, but he was a Copernican. And he was tried as a heretic in 1623, but he got off. Uh, but he had a lot of trouble with transubstantiation. He never quite knew what he felt about that. Uh, anyway... 1633 to present, the, the Catholic position seemed to change uh, even more dramatically. Um, it, partly because Galileo got more aggressive. <laughs> um, if you want to blame Galileo, as Catholics often do, or the conservative Catholics. But the, he, he was pushing them to make a stand. <coughs> when they did make a stand, they, they asked him to treat Copernicanism as a hypothesis, not as fact. And he, that he concluded with a statement saying that this theory limited God's uh, omnipotence. And he refused, he did, well he signed it, then he didn't keep those conditions. And he presented what was essentially a pro-Copernican argument. Now, at that stage, you didn't have to be an obscurantist to think that Copernicus maybe got it wrong. But the evidence was mounting for Copernicus, for the new astronomy. Uh, but he thumbed his nose at church authority, and that the church authority shouldn't have said what it said. Uh, what did they do to Galileo? Well, they did threaten him. Uh, he was under house arrest for a while, uh, uh, but he, they didn't burn him at the stake or anything. He died of old age, blind. I'm not minimising what they did. Um, you know, they could burn you at the stake, and they did burn some people at the stake. But 
essentially Galileo got a hard time, but there are a lot of people who got a, a harder time. Uh, and so I'll, I'll leave with that. Now, what's the, what's the Protestant view? Now, Protestant view tend to go the opposite way. The Catholics started out mild and got harder. Protestants started out with more doubts, but there's some real problems here. Oh, here's Luther uh, <coughs> in a discussion as to whether the moon derives its life from the sun. Luther says, I do not deny or condemn these claims, uh, but I declare by divine might that such powers were given to the sun. Now, that, he's not actually talking about the same thing. You know, in Genesis 1, verse 16, it says, The moon is a great light. Uh, and in, people read that. Some read that as saying, the moon is a great light and the sun is a greater light. Again, Scripture is only speaking as we would see it. So if you go outside uh, on uh, full moon, you can see a lot better than if you go outside. Uh, um, and it's not a full moon. There's, uh, Jeffrey Blaine, he's got a fascinating book on Australia. Uh, full moon black kettle and he, he talks he writes about everything this guy but uh, on a full moon that's when bank robbers just, you know, Noel, Ned Kelly and all those characters, that's when they came out because they could see they could ride away uh, they rob the banks take off yeah. because if you did that in the dark you'd like to break your neck uh, so uh, same with churches they'd often have an evening service 3 o'clock in the afternoon why? because yeah, and if they had one at five o'clock, that was full moon, because people would get there and go home. Uh, whereas, it was, have you you've been to places where there's no lights at night, no street lights? It's dark, and that's that's this. There's no street lights. So, uh, so that's what Luther was talking about. That's also what Calvin was talking about, and he says, well, he he didn't believe that the moon had any light like a sun. It wasn't a second sun, just smaller. He, he believed that it was a moon. And the only light that came from the, the moon was a reflected light. Uh, he's not saying that Genesis 1 is inaccurate. He's saying it's fitting what was appropriate to everybody. Uh, the sun looks like the greater light, the moon very much the lesser light. Now, I'm wary of quoting Bertrand Russell uh, but he quotes Luther as saying that Copernicus was an upstart astrologer and a fool uh, in 1549 Melanchthon also dismissed the new astronomers as simply lovers of novelty and Calvin's views are quoted uh, in Psalm 136, verse 7, God made the great lights, that's what the verse says. Calvin says, the Holy Spirit had no intention to teach astronomy and proposing instruction meant to be common to the simplest and most uneducated persons. He made use by Moses and the other prophets of popular language that none might shelter himself under the pretext of obscurity. Now, he, he's not referring to Copernicanism. He was referring to Genesis 1, really, you know, the moon being the lesser light. That's what he meant. He, he says it's true that the other planets are larger than the moon, but it's stated a second in, the, in order uh, on account of its visible effects, you know, how we see it. We don't see the other planets because they're so further away. Now, he seemed to believe that the Earth was immovable and at the centre of the universe. He seemed to believe that, but he didn't actually say it. And Edward uh, Rosen, in, a, in an article, contends that Calvin had never even heard of Copernicus. So he's never responding to Copernicus at all. He didn't know anything about him. Uh, and there's been a debate on this, rather light on details, I must say, over Calvin's attitude to Copernicus. Luther fumed. This fellow wishes to turn the whole of astronomy upside down. Even those things that are thrown into disorder, I believe the Holy Scriptures, for Joshua commanded the sun to stand still and not the earth. Yeah, Joshua 10. And uh, that was his argument against Copernicus. Uh, 
Andrew Dixon White and Bertrand Russell quote Calvin without citation, and I've never found it in Calvin's works, and was much encouraged at Robert White too, and never found it in Calvin's works. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to exist. He says, uh, it's supposed to be on Psalm 93 verse 1 that the world is established, also is established, it cannot be moved, and concluded, who will venture to place the authority of Copernicus above that of the Holy Spirit? Calvin is supposed to have said that. I don't know where he got it from. It's, it's not in his commentaries, it's not in his sermons, uh, it, it's, it's not in the institutes. It's just, I don't know where he gets it from. So they're, they're the only places. Uh, this has been passed down by oral tradition somewhere um, so Rosen says R-O-S again uh, that having never heard of him Calvin had no attitude towards Copernicus uh, and that quote is just bogus uh, anyway let's push on from there uh, because essentially the story from there becomes that, yes, uh, as Copernicus' views gave more evidence behind them, Protestants just accepted that. So when Galileo is, you know, uh, nearly 70, 80 years after Copernicus' death, uh, is, he's having trouble with the Catholic Church. By that stage, the Protestant Church saw it as not an issue. Um, and the quotes, of, uh, that, I, I take it that the Calvin quote is bogus. Um, it's just not there. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I might sort of push on from there. Um, uh, if you want the notes, I've got some notes, so just to back that up. Um, and, and by the 17th century, you're getting... Well, John Donne, for example, you know his poem uh, at the round earth's imagined corners. Yeah, so the earth is round uh, and at the round earth, it, the earth is actually round, but it's got imagined corners. We still speak of the four corners. So we, uh, we don't mean the earth square. And John Donne's well of the, aware of that. So the, the, uh, the super scientists, so-called, who, who haven't read their sources, they so, yeah, all the Christians were flat earthers. All, all Christians uh, were opposed to Galileo, Copernicus, and, and, and it's uh, John Cotton in sixteen fifty four says the study of nature is a positive Christian duty. Uh, that's far more common. Uh, yep, quickly, let me do Isaac Newton. I only mention Isaac Newton because he's the scientist. He's not a, he's not a Puritan. Uh, in fact, he's anti-Trinitarian. He's deeply religious. And he writes more on theological and spiritual subjects than he does on science. Uh, he's usually remembered as a guy who invented gravity. Remember? Apple fell on his head. Uh, that's the first thing you learn about him. Uh, he maintained a strong emphasis on the natural order being utterly dependent on the sovereign creator. He did believe that, but he wasn't a Puritan. Uh, Principia was on gravity, published in 1687, so towards the end of this period. Uh, but he's he got this lovely sentence, if I've been able to see farther than others, it was because I stood on the shoulders of giants. That's always a good thing to remember. Um, now, let, let me just finish for... Um, amusement, nothing else. Uh, Jonathan Swift is mostly next century. Gulliver's Travels, there's a, a wonderful chapter there if you want to amuse yourself tonight. Um, you read chapter 5 of part 3 where Jonathan Swift, have you, you've done this, have you? If Jonathan Swift has, had, had visited the Royal Society in 1710. And he did what uh, the authors of Yes Minister did. That he just wrote down what they were doing. <laughs> That's what he said. Uh, and Utopia, the same thing. And uh, he, he, he never misses his targets. <coughs> and he did say exactly that. 
he, he said, I, I wrote down a lot of what they were doing, plus he made up some of it. But let me just read some of it. Uh, this is the Royal Society, yeah, 50 years after it, it was, it's all, after it was established. Everything gets, goes corrupt. Uh, you have to leave it very long and it loses it. One man spent eight years on a project trying to extract sunbeams out of cucumbers. <laughs> uh, another man uh, was trying to reduce human excrement to its original food. I don't know how you sell that. But anyway. uh, another was writing a treatise on the malleability of fire while an architect was working on how to build houses from the roof downwards. Uh, one, one scientist planted an acre of ground with acorns and chestnuts and dates, then let hogs loose on it. They ploughed up the ground and manured it, but they rendered it unsuitable for growing crops. They couldn't grow anything on it. Uh, another man fed spiders with coloured flies in the hope of producing coloured webs to be used as silk. This whole you know, cut out was part of the process of turning. Uh, one scientist had a plan for breeding sheep without wool, and there were projects to abolish words. Uh, so the, the Royal Society was not just science, but everything. And this, uh, there, there was actually a project to abolish words. You, you walk around with a, uh, a, a wheelbarrow, mm, mm, you back to the Neanderthal thing, <laughs> and, you know, Bellingen or whatever. Uh, and this is what uh, improves communication. Uh, it's more accurate, that was the idea. Uh, so there was somebody actually working on that thing. Yeah, 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 we're, we're, we're doing it quite nicely now. Um, <laughs> so not of all of this was satire. Uh, there were earnest experiments conducted by scientists in the Royal Society. So the lesson is so much of life is double-sided and all the achievements also carry with them the seeds of de decay and distortion. I think that's... Um, yeah, so there is a right and a, a godly view of science and there is a way of just mangling everything. And, uh, so I'll leave you with that.